Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to Freight Forecasting. I'm Mike Vincent. I am uh, your host for this TV show. Uh, number two, last week, uh, uh, well, the show is, is, is covering freight forecasting, really, the what is freight forecasting, why should you be freight forecasting, who is uh, a freight forecaster, and how is it done, and with what tools and with what data sets, the importance uh, so on and so forth. So we'll take deeper and deeper dives as the series moves on. Um, but uh, quickly, last week, uh, some of the things that we covered were pretty high level, and we'll stay high level again today. I've got some better uh, examples of some things as we go through today's uh, show. But we'll try and stay a little bit high level, and then as the shows go uh, move forward, we'll get deeper and deeper into specific data sets, specific tools. We'll bring in some of our market experts and some external people in here to talk about freight forecasting and how to utilize it and how really to set it up and just how important it is to your business and what kind of value you can drive out of freight forecasting, uh, whatever your business be, shipper, carrier, 3PL, intermediary, whatever you want to call yourself, uh, in transportation or those who use transportation. So uh, last week, really quickly, we, we talked about what is uh, freight forecasting, right? And so briefly in a nutshell and very dry, freight forecasting is a process of developing uh, predictive models of what the freight market will look like in the future, right? And this can range from 24 hours today up to 24 hours and out even past one, one year uh, and, and further, uh, as you look at different types of data sets, right? Some of them lend very, very well to tactical decisions, but as you start to get into uh, digital signals on uh, potential geopolitical events and uh, macroeconomic trends, et cetera, you start looking more and more uh, long-term, uh, looking back and backcasting, if you will, with some of the different uh, capacities and demand, uh, uh, capacity availability and demand for that capacity over the different modes and different trade lanes, et cetera, um, the, you can start to utilize those data sets to also predict into the near and long-term future as well, as well as monitoring exactly what's happening today. So uh, very important stuff, very, very uh, um, useful, uh, but very, very intricate, a very difficult job. The freight market is really, you know, the area of the economy where the movement of goods uh, is priced and where it takes place, where it's executed, right? And that can be anywhere. So, and it could be truckload, it could be a, a maritime or air, et cetera, rail, intermodal. So that's the marketplace. Um, in other words, when we talk about that marketplace and the, and the, the price of goods being moved and, and the execution thereof, we're talking about the liquidity of, of the global supply chain. And so what we mean by that is really the price fluctuates with, with demand and, and the supply of that capacity just like in normal markets. And when you're looking at it, you've got to be able to look at it very holistically and in great detail to be very accurate and to be able to freight forecast to avoid disruptions and to really uh, set your budgets and meet those budgets. <clears throat> so why do you do it? I just said why you do it. You do it to determine uh, the specific capacity that you're, that you're going to need to move your freight or the specific capacity that you're going to need to supply or services that you're going to supply if you're the carrier or intermediary, uh, not only to your current customers, but to future customers uh, and across all different modes and in all different markets. They all interplay with each other. <clears throat> Uh, it's also incredibly useful and why you should do it is to set realistic budgets. And we'll take a look at a couple things there to where if if you're a shipper where you set your budget and expectations over the next years to where you don't have those drop loads and you don't get caught off guard, you have the best possibility in your contracted freight to maintain those relationships and maintain a good solid movement uh, of, your, of your goods across the supply chain. Same with shippers and intermediaries as setting those expectations correctly and forecasting correctly what you think is going to happen over the next year, what is going to happen over over the next year in your, your specific vertical uh, so that you maintain the best relationships with your customers and at the same time being able to set realistic, well-educated, well-thought-through budgets for that year and then being able to make the dynamic changes uh, and foresee those to maintain that budget and come as close or beat that budget uh, through over the year. 
through the course of the year. We also talked really quickly about the tools and data sets, and the data sets vary greatly. And it's one of those things when you start digging into it, you start to see just how intricate and difficult a job it is uh, to be a freight forecaster and to be accurate at it. Uh, you're, you're talking about economic activity uh, data, import export data, tender load volumes are the number of loads being moved, um, the rejection of those loads or the ability of the capacity or the carriers to accept loads from shippers and move that depending on or no matter what the capacity may be, the mode of capacity it may be, monitoring critical events as they occur and looking at those digital those digital signals about uh, that can predict and, and show you possibilities for disruptions caused by geopolitical events or geological and weather-related events a, as well. So uh, it, it starts to get very, very, very uh, detailed, a uh, lot of inputs, requires a lot of expertise and more than one person, really, to freight forecast. You, you wind up with uh, experts in, in different uh, areas of the economy, different areas of transportation and logistics, uh, and different modes of transportation to help and assist with this freight forecasting. <clears throat> so today's show, what we're going to talk about here, if I can work this correctly, and I think I can, I've had practice. Uh, we're going to talk again a little bit about why, why freight forecasting, but we're going to dig in a little bit more with the role and the value of a freight forecaster, and then the skill sets of a freight forecaster and some of the freight forecasting tools. We'll touch on those briefly. The bulk of this is going to be in the role and the value of, a, of the freight forecaster today. Uh, as we move forward, really those skill sets, I'll bring in uh, experts in freight forecasting as far as from different uh, verticals or, or their different uh, areas of expertise, uh, economic data from a shipper's perspective, from a carrier's perspective, a 3PL's perspective, the different modes, air, intermodal, uh, maritime, etc., to go through some of the skill sets, data sets, and tools that they use to be very, very effective uh, freight forecasters to help you along your journey. <clears throat> so with that, let's uh, move forward a little bit uh, to the next, uh, next area here. So why freight forecasting? Freight forecasting, when we look at it, it's, it's essential, like I said before, uh, to building accurate and well-educated financial budgets, right? And it's also extremely useful and important to manage and meet those budgets or to manage your transportation and supply chain costs and efficiencies through the course of the year in order to keep a dynamic living, make those changes to avoid disruptions, to get the best costs that you can or the highest revenues that you can, maintain your ma margins to meet those budgets throughout the year. Uh, shipping and logistics departments and, and, and uh, for shippers, uh, you know, they, they, they use projected sales, cost of goods sold, et cetera, to build their transportation need and their, their budget predictions. Um, and transportation, obviously, is a huge uh, cost of goods sold, as, ma sold, as many have, have stated and, and some of you know from, from uh, experience. Uh, so it's important to understand the freight markets and all the intricate little data points changes pressures around the globe and in all the markets across all the modes of transportation uh, to be able to meet those budgets and not get caught off guard and be able to manage and adjust your supply chain or your transportation uh, strategy throughout the years, year and years, um, you know, to meet those budgets. So a dynamic transportation and supply chain or dynamic use of your services that you provide your customers if you're a carrier or you're an intermediary um, in order to meet those budgets. So that's really what we're talking about here. So uh, the next slide, let's move on. <clears throat> the role of a freight forecaster. And we can talk to these three different points. It's essentially a very, very difficult task as we've been talking about. And as we get deeper and deeper into what freight forecasting is, you'll just see how just uh, r really detailed and intricate it can be. Um, but it, 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 it's a very difficult task. They have to track all the segments of the economy, and they need to be looking across all the different modes of capacity if they're truly going to be an accurate forecaster and be of, of it's the, extract the greatest value from freight forecasting. 
Uh, and they have to have the ability and skill set to create forecasting models using back testing, back casting, if you will, uh, to look at different trends and data to see how we got to the state that we are today in specific markets across different uh, the different modes in the economy, et cetera, to be able to understand how we got to today, to be able to produce accurate forecasts into the future to be able to react like we talked about. So what we're really talking about here is – um, is BAMF or B-A-M-F or benchmarking, analyzing, monitoring, and forecasting. And so being able to benchmark your company's uh, uh, performance, uh, operational and financial against the broader market and, and broader peer sets, et cetera, through data analysis is important to understand where do you sit in the best of the best? Where can you improve? How can you set realistic goals and see – how are the best of the best doing it? So benchmarking against others in your peer group is ex- is essential and a, and, a, and a very strong part of, of freight forecasting to understand exactly where you are and where are those pain points that you can actually adjust based on your financial your financials, your P&Ls, et cetera. But also operationally, looking at the broader market and also in your peer groups. If you're a reefer carrier, uh, what are the other refrigerated capacity uh, uh, providers doing in specific markets and across uh, uh, different lanes, et cetera? Maritime, if you're in maritime or air cargo, how is the broader market reacting to different things and what are their trends? Knowing where you're going is, is, is very, very important and difficult enough, but knowing where the entire uh, uh, the broader market is going or where it came from or how it got to where it is is essential in understanding your own business and being and able to evaluate what is it that uh, is it external or internal events, decisions, occurrences uh, that are that are driving your profits or contracting your profits or God forbid losses. Uh, finding out where those are. So benchmarking against the broader market in your group of peers is is huge. Analytics, analyzing all the different data sets. Um, and, and market conditions, the different pressures, the supply and demand of capacity, the movement of goods, um, and how the different modes interact in the past up to present, like I said before, is essential to understanding where we are right now and being able to move into the future. <clears throat> now, that's all very well and good, but you also need to have the tools and the data sets to be able to monitor what is happening right now. When I wake up this morning and the markets are this way that concern my business, I know how they got there. Why are they the way they are today? And what is occurring today that is going to affect our decision making today? Can I get that information so that I can be highly productive today to move the most loads or to keep my trucks running or to avoid disruptions in my supply chain and make sure those goods are getting on the shelf or the the components, the raw goods needed to, for production are arriving on time and the cost is, is, is in line with my budget? So how can I make those tactical decisions and monitoring in real time or as near real time as you can what is going on in the marketplaces that are important to you and the data sets that are important to your business is essential. And, and that's the M. And then uh, the F or forecasting is the next piece. How do I determine what we're going to do tomorrow, next week, the next month, the next six months, the next year, et cetera, and bringing all those in? So that's what we call BAMF or Benchmark, Analyze, Monitor, and Forecast. And there's some that will tell you that it is, it is, it is better or more accurate uh, or easier uh, to do in a less complicated form. Uh, I challenge that greatly. This is not a case of applying Occam's razor. This is uh, this is uh, a case of understanding as intricately and uh, as you can the markets, how they got there, why they move, what drives those changes so that you can extract the most out of your business and you can drive as much value to your customers as you possibly can. Simplicity is not the goal here. Accuracy is the goal here. And it takes a lot of different uh, sets of data, takes a lot of skills, and it takes many different uh, um, um, uh, uh, skill sets, data points. It takes a little bit of art. It takes some science. Uh, It takes a lot of knowledge to be able to do this. And that's why 
the program and we're working through this. So simplicity is not the case. It's one of the most difficult tasks is freight forwarding or freight freight forecasting, excuse me. <clears throat> one of the most difficult tasks uh, that in an organization uh, is freight forecasting. And it, it, you don't, it, it's because you don't only have to know about your business, your products that are moving, what are your raw material goods needs and when do they need to come in and the volume that is moving, how much capacity you need to get your goods on shelf or to the customer, uh, how much capacity do you need and are you allocating to your contracted customers versus the spot market? Where are you going to look for those loads to move the most loads and add value to your customers as an intermediary? Those are very, very important and knowing those things are very, very important, but it becomes very, very difficult because you have to understand how everybody else is reacting to, not only in your vertical, but across all verticals and what their impact is happening or is having on, on your supply chain or on your ability to provide services for your customer. So it's extreme, it gets extremely, uh, extremely difficult. Uh, let me gain some real estate here in my dashboards. Uh, in, in sonar here, I need volatile markets is the one that I had built out for today. So here it is. <clears throat> so let me pull up this dashboard and talk to it a little bit with you, uh, and show you some of the intricacies that we're talking about, the different data sets that we're talking about. So on the left hand side here, what we're talking about here is, is, uh, uh, uh surface transportation truck. And you're looking at all the different markets and we're looking at different data sets to see, okay, we're comparing outbound volume or the number of loads that are moving in that in that particular uh, market or on a particular lane. We're also looking at the amount of those loads that are being rejected or what are the percent of those loads that are being rejected on a daily basis? Is it 10 percent? Is it 5 percent? Is it 6 percent? And we're looking at the inbound and outbound flow within those markets as well. And then tender lead times. Are the shippers offering loads or tendering loads to carriers to pick up today or is it in the next four days. All these things are very, very important in understanding where the pressures are. Where are rates going? Is there capacity crunch in that particular market or on that particular lane that's going to disrupt my supply chain? Am I a carrier and I'm going to have a difficult time finding loads in this market? Uh, am, I a, 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 am I an intermediary and this is a place where I can go get loads or do I have customers in this specific area and I know now that waking up this morning, the capacity is very, very tight and I need to get some capacity in there to make sure that I'm fulfilling my service commitments and adding value to my customers. That's one thing. On the right-hand side, we're looking at a map um, and what this map is looking at is imports uh, versus rail <clears throat> and all the all the uh, the uh, the effects of that. So this is another set of data points that, on a daily basis, a freight forecaster is going to be uh, needing to look at. And so what we're looking at here is the imports by market. U.S. imports by market is the is the colors here, and you can see that obviously the ports are much higher in imports maritime than are the inland. Uh, but so we're looking at those ports. So the deeper blue are the greater amount of imports. Now we're also looking at the outbound rail uh, um, uh, volume of international uh, uh, loaded containers um, moving. Um, moving intermodally in these markets. Let me zoom in here a little bit. Well, I didn't want to zoom the whole screen, so let me just zoom in this way a little bit here and then move this over. And we're also tracking all the vessels that are coming in. Now, it's real-time vessels that are going in here, and you can see behind these uh, are actually all the different, uh, the, the exact number of TUs, all the, ship, uh, all the shipments that are on there that are coming into that port, and you can see what's going on. Further to that, we're tracking on this one here, the wait times uh, in these specific in these specific markets. So as we as we go across these and we look at the different markets that are here, uh, for instance, if we click on this, we're looking at the New York Seaport, and currently the wait times are 80 minutes. So uh, for truck. And so, do I change that to rail? Do I change do I change rail over to truck? You're looking at that, and then all the other the uh, the other data points that are within this market that are concerned with maritime and its effect on surface transportation, whether it be rail, intermodal, or truck, are also in here to be able to look at. 
And you need to be able to, to uh, go through and, and track these and see how is that effect happening today. Uh, in other words, monitoring what are the conditions in this specific port or the other ports that I may uh, be concerned with. <clears throat> also, looking at the different imports by, by, by industry can help you. And when you start to trend these, these different pressures, can you trend these out and look and see what these pressures are and find those correlations, which we'll go through in great detail in subsequent shows, to show you how to look at these different trends and see how specific industries up or down fluctuating can uh, have impacts on different modes of transportation. So that's a little little taste of just how difficult and how intricate a freight forecast uh, uh, can be when you start looking at these things. So um, <clears throat> another one that I really wanted to look at here uh, when we're talking about the value of a, of a freight forecaster, let me move this over here and bring this down here. I look at another dashboard that I have called uh, uh, National Bid. And so some of the information when you're looking at, at National Bid, people look at pricing and so on and so forth, and that's a good thing to be looking at quite obviously, but simpler isn't better. More data and understanding it and being accurate with its forecast is better. So this particular dashboard is something that a freight forecaster uses in pricing when they're looking at bids and they're also looking at uh, adjustment of pricing throughout the year. And you're looking at the seasonality not only of spot prices, which is in the, in the center of this screen, but in the upper left, and let me get you a little bit more uh, real estate here so you can see this a little bit better. I'll slide this over a little bit. We're looking at vans specifically, the... Uh, the van outbound tender rejections or the, or, or the availability of capacity, the ability of dry van carriers to accept rate last year versus this year. So you can see where those trends are going and you can see that those rejections are obviously dropping and, and have been and are following last year pretty closely as far as the drop off and are, and are pretty much even from last year. On the bottom, on the bottom part, uh, we're looking at um, <clears throat> the volume or the volumes of loads for dry van. So you're looking at the pressure side or the demand side. This is giving you the relative capacity uh, or supply. The bottom left is giving you the demand that is going on. And then on the right side of this, uh, of this particular dashboard, uh, I've broken it down into uh, reefer as well. So again, you have the rejects or the capacity um, uh, or supply of, of reefer carrier uh, capacity uh, last year versus this year. And then the outbound tender volume uh, index or the number of loads nationally being offered uh, the demand for reefer, carry, uh, reefer capacity is inside here. And so th these different things need to be taken into account as well as other economic data, weather trends, as cold weather can put much more capacity, uh, demand for, for um, an environmentally controlled capacity uh, when it's extremely cold. Uh, and if that bleeds over into produce season, et cetera, it creates uh, more havoc on capacity or more demand on capacity. So other than just rates doesn't do it. You have to look at the different trends year over year and where they're trending now and forecast what different events are going to have uh, uh, effects on that supply chain as you move forward and you, and you look into your, your budget and your bids and how you're going to maintain those bids and how you're going to maintain those budgets throughout the, uh, the rest of the year. Um, so, <clears throat> Let's get back to, um, I think I swipe this way. I do. <clears throat> so some of the other things that we need to look at, we talked about the fact that, that rates are good <clears throat> and can give you, uh, you absolutely need to look at the rates and how they change, but you have to look at all the other different uh, intricacies and things that are, that are, that are being, uh, uh, that are affecting those rates and are affecting, affecting the market. Um, <clears throat> so, again, the difficulty of a freight forecaster, they have to, and I get, think you're getting a sense of it, they have to have their finger on the pulse of the global freight market or the broader freight market 
uh, depending on, on, you know, are you a global shipper? Are you a global provider of capacity for transportation? Are you a global intermediary uh, uh, or broker? And so looking at the, the entire globe and having your finger on the pulse of that is incredibly important. What is the impact of one mode of transportation upon another boat mode of transportation? How does spikes in consumer electronics uh, uh, af affect the movement of raw goods, or how does that affect air cargo? How does a, a, a port slowdown affect air freight cargo, and how do you predict those things? Well, if you know the volume of imports maritime that is moving and can track that and can forecast that, you can forecast then uh, uh, vessel efficiencies, port efficiencies, and if you combine that with uh, the the inland portion or rail, intermodal, and truckload capacity and those pressures in those port areas where the maritime is coming in, you can start to predict slowdowns and see when it may behoove you to move to air freight or change from rail to to truckload, et cetera, et cetera. So very, very important things. Um, also, they have to understand all the the critical events, both geological, weather-related, and <clears throat> geopolitical that may be happening. And so let me move over here again, go over into another dashboard here and show you, give you a quick example of that. Um, and what am I looking for here? I'm looking for my critical events supply chain uh, digital. I think I have it up here, critical events. I don't think I clicked it. There we go. So when we look at this, I've got a couple different uh, different widgets up on this particular uh, uh, dashboard. But on the right-hand side, we'll focus there uh, first real quickly. Uh, the right-hand side here, we're tracking all the different threats, wildfires, earthquakes, tropical cyclones, etc. There's a lot of different things that you need to be looking at as, as well. Uh, precipitation, uh, icy roads, etc. We'll get to those. But in the critical uh, e events, what you need to be looking at is looking at what assets of yours <clears throat> or that can affect your, your supply chain, what is, what is going on, what is going on there and, and understanding what are those, what are those risks? So uh, as you drill down and look at different things, like you've got Jamaica with a, a, a high earthquake uh, over the next couple days, um, a uh, uh, threat across the across the United States. When we look at the United States, let's bring this over here. We see that there's there's not a lot of um, extreme uh, 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 events here. But we can drill down and take a look and see what those issues are. Wind gusts, obviously, for surface transportation can be quite uh, are, are are quite important. But you get the idea of of looking at all the different um, the different uh, uh, critical events, weather related, that can be that can that can affect your supply chain. Another one over here in this other widget on on this map widget, looking at this, and we're looking at uh, surface transportation, road surface transportation. So if we drill down a little bit and look at these things, so what is the actual surface uh, uh, conditions for those roads for for transportation? Now, obviously, we're not in hurricane season, although we were tracking hurricane over there on the west coast of Australia about a week ago and looking at the difference or the changes in the um, the maritime trade lanes and, and the disruption it was causing there. Not severe, but it was. Uh, we were looking at that. We don't have any of those events today, thank goodness, and we know that by monitoring. But looking at the, the road surface transportation in the United States, um, you have some issues that can occur uh, uh, and have to reroute and, and, and uh, plan for some possible delays and some possible um, cost increases as, as the mileage may increase to, to move those loads across the, across the lanes. <clears throat> so that's a quick look into those those digital uh, or into those uh, those weather related. Uh, another dashboard that I have here is uh, the supply chain digital. And what I'm looking at in the supply chain digital and to and to further illustrate the point of the necessity and the the intricacy of freight forecasting is looking at geopolitical 
uh, events that could be happening. And so keeping your pulse on, on what is going on through, through real-time news coming in, what is going on through trusted sources on social media, what is being talked about, and then gauging that percentage of what is being talked about through digital si uh, signals can show you and lead you down where are those possible geopolitical events going to happen? What is new technology? What are they talking about? What could be happening in the next year to two years, staying informed of the latest trends, the latest policy changes that could be affecting that? But also, what is everybody talking about? Are they talking about the possibility of a Lufthansa strike? Are they talking, what are they talking about here? Are they talking about the Brexit issues that are going on right here? Um, or, and various other topics. So understanding what is hot and what are all the people in the know talking about so you can research those and plan for those events that may happen is essential to freight forecasting. <clears throat> so let's move on. I'm going the wrong way. There we are. <clears throat> so uh, the other parts of the role and value of a freight forecaster is really creating those forecasting models to to quantify opportunities. Where are there emerging markets? Where are those markets uh, uh, changing? We looked a little bit last week in the change on maritime routing due to tariffs and new trade partners and how that has affected uh, the movement of goods maritime across the globe from Asia to the United States and it's changed from uh, uh, the West Coast and now growing heavily on the East Coast and how that can impact the transportation on surface, rail, intermodal, and, and truckload, and then eventually the location for warehousing and final mile distribution uh, can have can be affected as well. So we looked at that a little bit, but looking at and quantifying those opportunities, looking for changes that are going to be disruptive so that you can have a long-term plan, but also a very tactical plan. So when we're talking about tactical plans, what is the mix of spot versus contracted freight look like in specific markets, and how is that pressure changing? changing the rates. Are spot rates higher or lower? Do I want to actively manage my routing guide? How much of my fleet do I need to be, do I need to be uh, looking at uh, uh, moving over to the spot market side or how much can I afford to move over to my spot market side depending on those volumes from my contracted shippers? Uh, where can I find those loads to keep my assets moving? Where are my distribution points as a shipper that may be in danger of losing capacity because of fluctuations in, in the number of outbound loads in that particular market or the change in the ratio of, of, of headhaul? Are there less outbound loads than inbound loads now? And does that indicate that uh, capacity is, 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 is loosening and therefore pressures on price are dropping? Or is it the opposite? Is outbound volume spiking? Maybe not my own, but in that market and the inbound freight is shrinking, meaning there's more capacity leaving than coming in. And, and if this happens quickly enough at a high enough uh, change rate or over an extended period of time, what kind of effect is that going to have on my business? Am I going to be falling out of my, my routing guide unexpectedly? Am I going to be having dropped loads? Are my contracted carriers just not going to be able to, to handle all the volume that is there? Not due to my own business. That's why I need to be looking at the broader market and understanding what is going on and how the different modes are interplaying with each other and even how are the markets around me affecting my market. <clears throat> is there another market growing heavy outbound at this particular time that may be not structural or seasonal that we see every year, but this disruptive outbound in a market very near mine that is causing the capacity to come into my market deliver and then deadhead into that market and I'm losing out on capacity and having difficulty with my rates or getting loads moved. All these things are extremely important to be looking at. <clears throat> Estimating those load volumes and that avail uh, available capacity is what I'm talking about and identifying those capacity trends uh, is very, very important to avoid those disruptions and in some cases take advantage of, of, of where the market is heading so that I can get a little bit cheaper price or I can move my goods a little bit better or I can get more loads and more turns on my assets uh, or I can book more loads and maintain my margins better. I can add value to my customer uh, as an intermediary or
or a carrier knowing that these things are coming and therefore assign specific capacity to contracted, move it from spot or from contracted to spot to keep it moving so that I can, <coughs> excuse me, so that I can maintain an acceptable margin so I don't have to go back to that chipper for a rate increase when these capacity crunches come because I'm taking advantage and I've got a fluid plan that is going to help me not only service that customer, but maintain my margins and move loads <clears throat> so I can continue to add value to that customer. That transparency is, is essential in a freight forecaster done well, not simply, but done well, uh, can provide that for, for you if you're a shipper, carrier, or intermediary. Um, not only forecasting freight rates, but also costs is, uh, are very important to a, to a freight forecaster. So another fairly tactical and also long-term uh, 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 data set that I want to display here uh, through another dashboard. Um, let me open this up again. There we go. My computer seems to be reacting slowly, but that's okay. We will pull this up. And this is um, ultra-low sulfur diesel. So future ultra-low sulfur diesel and then some trends here. So uh, what you're looking at here is, is next day rack prices. So about 2, 2.30, um, I'm receiving the information on where wholesale prices for diesel are affecting are coming in the next day. And so with this information uh, as a carrier, you'd be able to understand how much to fill, when to fill, do you, do you fill today in anticipation of higher prices tomorrow? Um, do you wait and top off tomorrow? Do you take a half tank and, and, and uh, uh, fill in a different market, et cetera, through these, this, diff, this tree map that shows you all the different markets and where tomorrow's uh, rack prices are going to be or wholesale price on diesel? Uh, you can also display it and should be looking at it by market to see where those relative changes are in those markets along the path of, of, of the goods that you happen to be moving. Another excellent thing that a forecaster needs to be looking at is, is the retail price versus uh, the wholesale price. And here we see a chart that puts those together, right? You have your, your retail price in the Blue Mountain, and then you have your rack, rack price uh, is, your, is your green line down here. And you can see how, how the, the spread, how it changes. Now, I've also have the spread... Um, mapped out on the bottom and this can show you exactly what you can be looking at as far as the spread between wholesale rack um, fuel surcharge etc very very important to shippers carriers <clears throat> intermediaries alike is knowing where fuel costs are going um, so trending that is extremely important just another data point when we talk about all these things it, it does get as simple as where does fuel price and it gets as complicated as how is Brexit going to affect my supply chain? Um, and and where does this earthquake affect a specific asset in my supply chain as well? <clears throat> so it gets very, very, very uh, complicated. Um, the freight forecaster also has to anticipate uh, volatility due to seasonal um, seasonal changes. Not only that there is uh, a produce season, but how is that produce season uh, uh, evolving this particular year? A couple few years back, a a, a uh, colleague of mine who was at a uh, former company, we worked together at a former company, he was still there, I was over at Freight Waves already, uh, is calling me and asking me why was there, I believe it was June, just exploded 20% increase in revenue, LTL carrier, 20% increase in revenue. Highly concentrate, concentrated in, in the Southeast. He's calling me because I'm at Freightways. What is going on? So I asked him, look at the shipments. What was it? Because he was sure that they didn't just have this incredible sales uh, uh, program that blew up 20% in top line revenue. So looking at those shipments and their relative size, they're all in a 12 to 15, 16, 17,000 pound range, all volume spot market contracts. They were eaten up with them, blown up with them heavy, heavy pressure on their profitability. Uh, good top line revenue, bad because those are usually used to fill 
uh, space on those LTL, uh, those L- on the LTL capacity. And so what had occurred was during that time, you couldn't find a truckload out of the Southeast over to Dallas for less than $4,000. The capacity just wasn't there. The rains had returned to California and it was a great produce season, but it was also a delayed produce season that then spilled over into the Southeast produce season, which ate up capacity, which caused shippers to be falling out of their uh, routing guides and not being able to find capacity. And that capacity that they were finding, they couldn't afford. So breaking up those truckloads into spot volume uh, market contracts was the way to go. If LTL carriers had that information, were freight freight forecasting and looking at those signals and those supply and demand uh, changes for truckload, they'd have been able to see this and have been able to avoid uh, not the huge spike in revenue, but avoided pricing all this uh, additional spot market volume uh, contracts at the normal rates that they would because they lose money uh, when they have four 15,000 pound shipments on an LTL trailer that should have a few hundred, uh, you know, 50 pounds, 1,000 pounds, 1,200 pounds, 15, uh, you know, 2,000, 2,500 pound shipments going across there instead of 100 bill of ladings, they got four. Uh, and that changes the dynamics greatly and, and, and obviously hurts the margins for an LTL carrier. So um, so that had occurred, and had he been freight forecasting uh, and looking at the different markets and signals, he could have definitely uh, avoided that. So <clears throat> when we look at the skills of freight forecasters, and we'll look at this briefly because we'll, we'll be getting into this in much more detail in next shows, but the skills of a freight forecaster, we won't go much deeper than it's a balance of art and science, right? Uh, the art is really uh, – the science, uh, I should say, is, is really being able to look at historical patterns and build those models out um, uh, that have a power to explain – how the variables account for the results of, of today. Well, how did we get to today? And then figuring out, okay, if I can predict, if I can go back and backcast and predict where we got to today using, using these specific variables, I can then use that moving forward. Uh, the ability to analyze and having those tools uh, to do that is the science part. The the art part is is knowing the industries, having those market experts, whether it be economic or they or they be parts of or, or, or experts in the various modes of transportation, is is where you start to bring in in the art and and realize that the correlations between a couple of different data sets or a few different data sets are are are, are not just spurious. They 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 are actually correlated and do move together. They just uh, and affect each other. So there's an art to bringing in this can affect that and understanding the markets. Uh, but then the science of having the analytical tools and the and the uh, intellect uh, is a science part and, and very, very important as well. <clears throat> when we look at, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Looking at the tools of a freight forecaster, uh, <clears throat> multiple data sources, and a badass calculator. Now, <clears throat> I say that a little bit tongue in cheek, but it's true. You, you 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 need a little bit more than a than a spreadsheet to be able to look at these things. You've got to be able to to develop those correlations and those those forecasting models uh, that I won't even pretend to uh, uh, pronounce and describe to you. We'll get bring in some experts in in that area of analytics to talk about that in in future shows. But uh, the multiple data sources is extremely important. You're bringing in rate forecasting uh, for multiple different loads of, modes of transportation. And then to be able to, to, to predict those rate forecasts, you need to know the supply and demand and all the macroeconomic research needed to look at the industry trends, etc. Diesel pricing, weather forecasts, financial markets – to name just a few, and then you start getting into how does economic trade policy or international trade policy affect this? How does how is this particular piece of legislation going to affect um, where's consumer sentiment, housing starts, et cetera, bringing all these things together? First, gathering all these data, figuring out what all this data is that you're going to need is, is, is hard enough, but having the badass calculator or the toolkits is another very, very difficult uh, uh, task to assemble that type of stuff. So the key 
that I want to leave you with today is, and we've covered a lot of stuff, and hopefully I didn't talk in too many circles. And like I said, this is designed to really get you a, a, a good overview of what we're talking about when we talk about freight forecasting and give you a sense of just how difficult it is. Uh, we will get more technical and in the weeds uh, starting with next show. The key to take apart, to take away from this is that it's essential to be gathering a very, very diverse uh, uh, information, lots of different data sources, but then creating the ability to easily ingest it and then analyze it all in one place is extremely important. You can run around and find all this data sources and sign this contract and scrape it from there and bring it in from these locations and then you have all these disparate data sources all over the place. Bringing that together so that you can gain some knowledge out of it, so that you can glean something that's going to give you actionable insights, make some decisions to positively affect your business is, 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 is the next step. And, it, and it's very, very important to consider how are you going to bring these data sets together? Who is going to bring these data sets together? And what tools are you going to use to analyze, create these benchmarking capabilities, analytics capabilities, monitoring capabilities, and forecasting, forecasting capabilities? Who's going to be able to do that? But then how are you going to disseminate that information to the rest of the organization? Who needs that information? What parts of that information do they need? Uh, and, and when do they need it? What is the best information for very tactical decisions? And who are those people that need to see that tactical decision? How far out into the future or prediction do you need your fleet manager to be, to be, uh, to be looking? Does a freight forecaster or a freight, I mean, excuse me, a, 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 uh, a broker uh, at a 3PL need to see what this market is going to be doing next month and next year at this particular time? Or do they need to wake up in the morning and know, this is where I need to concentrate to get the most loads. This is where I need to concentrate to maintain margins. This is what I need to look at to maintain uh, the value uh, that I provide my contract to customers. <clears throat> so deciding all that and figuring out what is the best mode to do that. Do you have that internal bandwidth to disseminate that information so that people are looking at this information and making homogenous decisions across the organization? In other words, does Mike Vincent look at this information and make this decision? And then the next person next to me is looking at the exact same information, but sees it in a different way and makes a different decision. So homogenous decision-making is incredibly important. We'll dig into all that stuff as we move forward in, in freight forecasting in future shows. So um, I thank you if you stayed on for a second week. I, I'm getting better at this, I think, I hope, uh, getting more comfortable with uh, dis, uh, discussing this with you. And hopefully I've given you a good base or overview of what freight forecasting is and what we're talking about. And so we set the stage so that next week we can start digging in with a little bit more detail in specific areas. So, uh, hey, from Freight Waves, Mike Vincent, Freight Forecasting, uh, peace and love. See you next week.